So the focus for today's lecture is going to be somewhat, I mean the content that we are going to be covering is some going to be somewhat more advanced, most like very topical. In fact, we are going to be uh, looking at some of the results uh, that first came on 2016. So which is more about uh, like some advanced results on PL inequality and we will be using those results for showing the robustness of the optimization algorithm that we had looked at in the previous class. So just to quickly recap. So we started looking at this notion of finite time and fixed time stability and we looked at this particular uh, rescale gradient flow which was defined as x dot is some with p greater than 2 and this was shown to be finite time convergent. In fact, uh, we looked at the Lyapunov characterization of finite time stability of equilibrium and uh, so if I look at the Lyapunov characterization. So if your Lyapunov inequality or the time derivative of the Lyapunov function satisfies this particular inequality with alpha being a number between 0 and 1, then you can show the trajectories they converge to the equ equilibrium in a finite amount of time which is dependent on the initial condition x0 and that settling time function is actually upper bounded by z times 1 minus alpha. So this was uh, finite time stability. You can also talk about fixed time stability of uh, such equilibria if the Lyapunov function satisfies inequality of this form c1 v to the alpha 1 c2 v to the alpha 2 with alpha 1 between 0 and 1 uh, alpha 2 is a number greater than 1. So this you can show is in fact now fixed time convergent meaning that the settling time function is independent of x0 and this is going to be upper bounded by 1 over c1 1 minus alpha 1 right and this is for fixed time stability. Yes, thanks for pointing that. So this should be v naught or v of x naught ok. So this is v of x naught alright. So and as I said this is nothing but reparameterizing your simple gradient flow. So in terms of trajectories that uh, your x1 and x let us say x is 2 dimensional ok. Let us assume x is 2 dimensional. So you have x1 and x2 and let us say origin is the equilibrium or optimal solution. So if your gradient flow uh, it is starting at some x x naught if your gradient flow let us say follows this kind of uh, trajectory. So the path that is traced by the fine uh, by this particular dynamical system or path that is traced by an equivalent dynamical system where uh, you have fixed like I mean you have the notion of fixed time convergence it is going to be exactly identical. So it is basically we are accelerating the speed like we are essentially accelerating along that path. So we are changing the speed with which we trace this path but the path is going to be exactly the same that path traced by it. As a function of time x1 t and x2 t would look different obviously but if I look at the path traced by uh, this particular dynamical system this is same as this is going to be the same as the path traced by a nominal uh, gradient flow without uh, normalization ok. For like let us say uh, if I look at this a simple gradient flow like this. So let us call this one a finite time convergent flow which looks something like this. With p greater than 2 and a let us call this 2 and a fixed time convergent gradient flow p minus 2 p minus 1 minus
with t greater than 2 and q is a number between 1 and 2. So, all these three dynamical systems they are going to trace the same path. So, it's just that you are doing curve reparameterization. So, in so essentially what you are doing is you are changing the like basically you are sort of changing the coordinate system and in the transformed coordinate you are converging uh, maybe you are running this new gradient flow right. So, so essentially you converge much faster and uh, essentially you would change the speed with which you trace this path, but the path that is traced by all these three dynamical systems these are going to be exactly the same ok. Yeah, that would yeah, any scaling would be the same. Though not when once you did, once you discretize it, that may not be the case, right? Because you are then then sort of like you're talking about discretized updates, so that may not be the same. But in continuous time, they are going to be the same. No, no, because like let's say in for the discretized one from after this point, the update like for the same step size. The simple gradient flow would suggest an like uh, would suggest an x which will like which will be somewhere over here, whereas maybe a fixed time gradient flow would suggest an update which is somewhere over here, right? And so they won't be like the part trace there would not be the same because it's it's because due to the discretization, but in continuous time they would trace the same path. Yeah. Okay. So that's another question that kind what kind of guarantees can we provide once we discretize these fixed time convergent gradient flow? So. Well, the guarantees are not of the form of that like for instance with gradient flow, uh, when you look at gradient descent for L smooth function, we had a specific characterization of the step size which was in 1 over L kind of step size, right. We do not have that kind of uh, interesting bounds on the uh, step size, but the kind of guarantees that you can provide is uh, if so the kind of results that exist is if the function admits a quadratic type of growth, admits a quadratic growth at max quadratic growth. Then if I look at this particular dynamic, uh, this particular discretized step, let us say step size eta, scale. So, this is basically the discretization of your fixed time convergent gradient flow. So, the kind of results or kind of guarantees that we have is there exists a small enough step size such that independent of the initial condition. Initial condition you like one uh, x would converge to an epsilon ball around x star in a fixed number of iterations. The kind of guarantees that we can provide are only of existence type. So, there exists a small enough step size such that the even the discretized flow or the discretized fixed time like the discretized version of the fixed time stable gradient flow because in discrete time you cannot talk about exact convergence to the optimal solution right and you can talk about in that in continuous time, but in discrete time even uh, maybe as a result of discretization you may just slightly overshoot your x star or undershoot your x star and so on right. So, if you fix an epsilon ball around your x star you would converge to that epsilon ball no matter where you start, you will converge to that epsilon ball within a fixed number of iterations independent of it, independent of your initialization. But uh, what would be the bound on the step size and things like that, that is in still an open problem. So, all you can, I mean all we have is the existence type result and not the uh, bound on the uh, specific, specific bound on the step size, ok. So, that is I mean that is where the current like sort of state of the art is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we do we do not know that the number of iterations as a function of theta. We do not know that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, if you have a dynamical system whose equilibrium is exponentially stable, you can potentially make it uh, fixed time stable by uh, changing by, by this kind of normalization. So, what like if you have any for any dynamical system that is exponentially stable, this can be achieved. So, you just have to do the normalization and that would make it make that particular equilibrium fixed time stable or finite time stable depending on what kind of normalization you end up doing. Okay. Let us say we are going to be working with, so we want to design a gradient flow, a rescale gradient flow which is fixed. So, let us let us call this, let us give it give it a name, we will just from now on we will call it FXTSGF which is fixed time stable gradient flow, ok. Let us see. Okay. So, suppose I want to design a fixed time stable gradient flow for, so we assume f is strictly convex. So, in the last lecture we looked at the case when f was strongly convex right and we were able to uh, design a, an fx like a fixed time stable gradient flow for that, but what if f is strictly convex? What kind of algorithm would work if f is strictly convex or let us say f is strictly convex such that Hessian of f is positive definite, right. So, the question is we want to design a gradient flow which is convergent in a fixed like which, which converges in a fixed amount of time. So, in the previous lecture we looked at the case when f was strongly convex, mu strongly convex and we were able to like for the when, when f was strongly convex. we had this particular gradient flow right, simple p minus 2 or p minus 1. Okay, and we showed that this was uh, convergent in a fixed amount of time. Now, if f is strictly convex, how can we modify this? Yeah, hash, like basically Hessian inverse right, the same we did like I mean the same thing that we did with the simple gradient flow right. So, when f is strictly convex, so we are now going to be designing a new type of gradient flow which is going to be again it is everything is inspired from simple gradient flow and then so the equivalent modification of the Newton's flow or which is of this form. And let us see if this works. So, when we have strictly convex uh, function, what would be a good choice for Lyapunov function? Like, like what is a good Lyapunov candidate for that? Half this thing, right? Because once you start differentiating it, you will get Hessian, and you have an Hessian inverse sitting over here. So, V dot is essentially transpose Hessian times x dot right and x dot is now hessian inverse times this. So, hessian hessian inverse that becomes identity. So, what you are left with is v dot is negative ok. Is this clear? So, this would mean that I can rewrite this as, so 2 minus the same exactly the same uh, approach. So, this would turn, turn out to be right and similarly 
टू टाइम्स क्यू ओवर टू के प्लस राइट एंड दिस इज नथिंग बट माइनस टू वी पी ओवर टू पी माइनस वन माइनस टू वी क्यू ओवर टू ओके एंड फॉर द स्पेसिफिक चॉइस ऑफ पी वेन पी इज ग्रेटर देन टू पी ओवर टू पी माइनस वन इज a number between 0 and 1 and for q between 1 and 2 this would be this exponent would be the number greater than 1 so essentially we are in uh, so that basically ensures that v dot is uh, essentially less than equal to certain thing i mean if it is equal to you can always always write the like i mean write this as less than equal to and you recover the so let let's call this to be alpha 1 To be p over 2p minus 1, and alpha 2 to be q 2q minus 1. So what you have here is 2 to the alpha 1, v1 alpha 1 minus 2 to the alpha 2, v of alpha 2, right? So this satisfies the with alpha 1. So alpha 1 is a number between 0 and 1, and alpha 2 is greater than 1 for these choices of p and q. and therefore that means this is fixed time convergent with settling time t less than equal to 1 over 2 to the alpha 1 1 minus alpha 1 plus 1 over okay so for strict like whenever you see strict convexity with hessian positive definite it makes sense to use uh, newton's type of flow or a modified newton's flow okay like this so you, so that i mean this is basically an accelerated version of the same newton's flow that we had looked at in the previous class another interesting thing to observe is let's say i'm looking at this particular optimization problem and i have a specific budget on how much time we want to allocate to solve this particular optimization problem right so i can choose my p and q in such a manner so that i basically come up with a bound on the time it's going to take to converge right so it's not just fixed time optimization it's also like predefined time optimization so if if you give me a bound that you want to solve this problem in this much amount of time you will accordingly choose your alpha 1 and alpha 2 that will actually like uh, ensure that the settling time is upper bounded by that that particular time and therefore you can you are guaranteed to uh, converge in that much amount of time right so this also if you have a budget on time so it also sort of specifies budget on total time required to solve the optimization problem for fixed time now right so once you have these two so that's the difference between finite and fixed right if you have a grid like gradient flow like this then it depends on the initial condition but if you have a gradient flow like this then you make it independent of the initial condition yeah so uh, looking so that it always has to so the numerical stability be affected by the part yeah 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 definitely so that that's why i said like the i mean you have guarantees in this like when you discretize it but the guarantees are only of the existence type so for small enough eta this would still hold but how small the eta should be it specifically if like even if let's say f is strongly convex and l smooth can we still specify eta in terms of mu and l uh, that is also an open problem it also depends on but then for the at least for euler uh, ranjikota all these standard discretization this i mean this result sort of holds true yeah that that there is a possibility that using symplectic euler you can possibly make it work but uh, in fact if the system is homogeneous as in like zero is the uh, like x dot is of the form x dot is a negative x so i mean that wouldn't so for instance if i'm trying to minimize x square i mean i obviously know the optimal solution which is x x, x equal to 0 but the corresponding simple gradient flow would be x dot is negative x or negative 2x whatever right but this is an example of homogeneous system if i'm trying to minimize x dot i mean something like x minus 1 whole square so x dot is negative of x minus 1 and that is a non homogeneous system right so 
so in general i mean for optimization it doesn't help but if you have if you are looking at just at the stability problem forget about the optimization problem if you are looking at the stability problem if you have a homogeneous vector field to work with then in fact you can specify this eta Inter you can specify the number of iterations as a function of eta but only for the homogeneous system it doesn't help us in the context of optimization but in the context of stability if you have origin being the equilibrium then you can actually uh, specify the amount of iterations it would take to converge uh, to an epsilon ball around uh, the origin. So only for homogeneous vector field you have explicit bounds but otherwise you, are, you I mean the bound of on eta is I mean that's some that's that's an open problem for non-homogeneous fields. No vector field, no cos vector field in this case is always a gradient, right? Negative of gradient is the vector field. So x dot, whatever is there on the right hand side is your vector field. Uh, cos function is always f of x. So, so obviously, I mean, since it works for strongly convex function, you can also extend it for functions that satisfy PL inequality. So we have been talking a lot about PL inequality, uh, but what does PL inequality really imply? Okay, and this is again one of the seminal results from uh, Karimi in 2016. So, if a function and the result says if a function satisfies PL inequality, then then it admits at least quadratic growth. So, I will tell you what this means. Let us say there is a function f that satisf satisfies peer inequality, peer inequality with exponent mu with modulus mu greater than 0. Okay. So that means f of x minus f star so it is lower bounded by a quadratic like function which grows quadratically. The function has at least a quadratic growth is what this particular result says. Is this is the statement clear? So if the function so function growth is at least quadratic if function f satisfies PL inequality. And for strongly convex function that was in fact the key point like if you if you are working with strongly convex function even when you are close to optimal solution because of this quadratic growth or at least quadratic growth you always have non vanishing gradients or you have big enough gradients to converge faster to the optimal solution which isn't the case with strictly convex functions for instance right so and the fact that most of the results that work for strongly convex functions also extend for functions which are potentially non convex like the functions that satisfy pale inequality that may also have to do with the fact that uh, i mean this these functions also admit some kind of quadratic type of growth. So, let us let us try to derive this ok. So, we know that f satisfies pair inequality ok. So, what does it mean? f need not be convex. This can be an invex function, any any invex function like some function that satisfy pair inequality are called invex function. So, so f need not be convex. Yeah, yeah. So, if pair inequality is, is satisfied like I mean if a function satisfies pair inequality you only have two options. Let me let me just write this and this will also be clear from here. So, this is your pair inequality right. So, there I mean on it, so either the minimizer is unique or you have a constant function. So, the, these are the only two possibilities. I mean we eliminate the trivial case. So, we assume that I mean we assume that uh, we are working with unique minimizer. All right. So, so we have this this as your PL inequality. Okay. So, let us now define another function g of x. 
एस स्क्वायर रूट ऑफ एफ ऑफ एक्स माइनस एफ स्टार इस जी ऑफ एक्स अ वैलिड फंक्शन एस स्क्वायर रूट वेल डिफाइंड हियर राइट राइट बिकॉज एफ स्टार एफ ऑफ एक्स इज ऑलवेज गोइंग टू एक्सीड एफ स्टार सो दिस इज अ पॉजिटिव फंक्शन एंड सिंस एफ सेटिस्फाइज पीयर इन इक्वालिटी so this implies f is a f is an invex function and g of x is simply defined by offsetting uh, f of x and taking the square root so you also conclude from here that g is a positive invex function i mean invex is not as important as much important as the positive part in this the g of x is always going to be positive okay so that's one thing that we need to keep in mind so what is the uh, gradient of g of x so that's going to be gradient of f of x okay is this clear and what about the norm of this gradient that's going to be the norm of this gradient of f of x so if i take the square of it it will be square of this thing right which is and here i can use pl inequality on f right i can use this one which would be greater than equal to mu over 2 okay the result that i have gotten is okay so before we proceed further with the proof why do you think we have defined the function like this because we want to show this quadratic growth right so that means g of x is greater than equal to square root mu or two times x minus x star is what we want to show okay so that's one of the reasons why we have defined the function this way the other thing is we somehow somewhere we had to use a pl inequality and that is used to show that this particular term is greater than equal to mu by 2 okay all right so now let's consider a gradient flow suppose we run this gradient flow x dot is negative of gradient of g of x okay suppose we run this particular gradient flow so this would have its own x as a function of time right like if you simulate this particular flow so what would be g of let's say you start at x not and at any time t g of x t what would this be by definition okay so this is just in like if you integrate gradient of g of i mean basically this particular term that's what you are going to get right we are looking at x not g of x not minus g right so which is same as let's call it t not or or even zero let's say t not is equal to zero I mean, it doesn't make a lot of difference okay so this is nothing but minus zero to t gradient g of x x dot dt is everyone with me on this so what is gradient x dot for this particular flow negative of gradient of g of x so that means g of x not minus g of x t is 0 to t okay and from equation 2 or inequality 2 we have this constraint on gradient of g of x square 
So this is greater than or equal to mu t over 2, okay. So what do we know about uh, this particular function g? g is a positive invex function, right. So from here we have g of x t which is less than or equal to g of x naught minus mu t over 2. That means there must exist a finite time when x of t basically becomes x star, right, okay, because this function, the minimum value of this function is 0. So there exists a finite time when this, uh, this function, this x of t becomes x star. So let us say that finite time is capital T since g of x t is positive. or rather non-negative or in fact I mean otherwise yeah so there exists some time t finite time t t less than infinity such that g of x t is g of x star right because at x star g of g is 0 okay. So now we have to somehow uh, so we now have obviously we are going to integrate from 0 to capital T now because so what is the length of a path that like if let us say if I if I try to basically uh, find the length of the trajectory starting at x naught and ending at x star what should that length be equal to dx. So basically actually it is a modulus of dx right because it is a length. So you can write this as x dot dt from 0 to capital D okay length of the path traced by this particular dynamical system okay and what is x dot by definition gradient or negative or gradient of g of x so and we know that this length is always going to be greater than or equal to if i join these two points by a straight line right so that means x naught minus x star Okay. The straight line distance between these two points is always going to be less than or equal to the total length that is traced by this particular uh, dynamical system or length of the path traced by this particular dynamical system, right? Starting at x0 and ending at x star. So let me call this as x0 x star so that it is also clear that we are looking at the length from x. So that is let us call this equation for inequality 3. Okay. So if I revisit this particular definition here or rather this, this term over here, so g of x0 minus g x star is essentially 0 to capital T just rewriting this particular thing from 0 to capital T which I can write this as 0 to capital T gradient of g of x gradient of g of x dt. So from this one in inequality 1 uh, or in rather inequality 2 gradient of g of x is greater than or equal to square root mu, mu by 2. So we can write this as Okay, and that is where we can use this inequality 3 which is, so this is from 2 and this is greater than equal to square root mu by 2, uh, it is not minus x star, this is from 3. Okay. What is g of x star by the way? 0, right? g of x star is 0. So that means g of x naught is greater than or equal to square root mu by 2 x naught minus x star for every x naught, right. And if I just write g of x in terms of f of x, so this is nothing but saying that f of x minus f star is greater than or equal to mu by 2 x minus x star whole square. And this completes the proof. Okay.
So having a peer, peer inequality with some modulus mu, that means a function at least has a, uh, some quadratic type of growth. So that's why you can also accelerate optimization of uh, functions that satisfy peer inequality. Even though the, those functions may not be convex, but because they have this quadratic kind of like they are lower bounded by this quadratically growing function, you can also accelerate optimization of such functions. Is this clear? No, there is no local minima, right? So, invex function also have a unique minimizer, but they may not be convex. So, this is an example. So, we looked at one particular example, right? x square plus 3 sin square x. So, this is not strongly convex because of this. In fact, this is not even convex. This is the function looks almost like this. But if you if you look at the uh, if you basically this particular function satisfies field inequality, okay. 